you are about to view one of a series of nine interviews with fiction writers from Wales. These were recorded between 1990 and 1993 in the studio on the campus of the Polytechnic of Wales, later the University of Glamorgan. They were made possible by a grant from the Welsh Arts Council, and thanks to the support of college staff and the generous participation of the writers and interviewers. There had previously been audio recordings of poets from Wales, and I took part in one of these recorded at Theatre Cloyd a few years later, but it struck me that no such record of novelists and short story writers had been undertaken, and that was an omission. Danny Absey, Ron Berry, Emir Humphreys, Sean James, Glyn Jones, Elaine Morgan, Leslie Norris, Alan Richards, and Bernice Rubens all agreed to take part. These recordings are very much of their time, pre-digital and made with a limited budget. There's no makeup, no gimmicks with a camera. The intro music is my 13-year-old daughter playing a piano practice. She went on to read law, not music. There was no rehearsal, just a broad agreement about the extract to be read and the direction of the conversation. There are no media frills, just talking heads. But what heads? What voices? 20 years on, the University of Glamorgan, together with the Welsh Academy of Writers, are making these recordings available again on the web as a resource for students and researchers and for the enjoyment of the general reader. Each writer reads a generous extract from their work and answers questions about themselves and their writing. Many of these writers, and one of the reviewers, are no longer with us. So what we have is a valuable, unique record of their character and voice. Yes. Well, everything at this stage in the boy's life is exaggerated. Yes. You know, it's either much more romantic and splendid, or much more squalid. Yes, I was interested in that because uh, I was, in fact, coming to the fact that, uh, mm. at the one um, extent, you have golden chains and knights in armor, and at the yes, other, you yes. have uh, yes. all sorts of squalid details yes, about. Yes, uh, yes. I, c I remember the mm. relative they go to mm. see who's whose leg has been seriously injured that's and he's right, washing yes. it with bucket water. And yes, that's right. Your yes. description of the yes. inside of the of leg. His leg, yes. The, uh, all yes. sorts of dreadful things happen yes. uh, to yes. do with maggots and worms and... Uh, yes, um, I'm always fascinated by such things. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think maggots and worms are delightful. <laughs> yes. You, 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 you get from them not only... You get a strange kind of beauty from them because it, well, not only is there the, yes. the natural reaction of, of, of the unpleasant, but your particularly your use of color in describing them and yes. in evoking them yes. brings in another dimension. I th yes, I think if I've got anything uh, as a writer, I've got a visual sense. You yes, know, yes, yes. Um, at one time I thought of being um, uh, going in for art and uh, not the, the, but anyway I didn't, um, and I always um, enjoy. Well, I enjoy painting very much now. Yeah. I do paint myself, and, and I enjoy looking at paintings yeah. and visiting exhibitions. And well, you have friends who are painters, mm. don't you? Uh, important I've got, friends I've who are got painters. some friends who are painters, yes. And mm. uh, I'm fascinated by painters, really. Mm. Yes. And uh, is that because there's some chime between the painter's visual sense and your perception of your own visual sense? Yeah, I think so. Yes, I think so. I think that's part of my visual sense as a writer, I think. And your, yeah. your, your medium is language, yes. which gives you much yeah. a much wider scope than a painter, I think, in many ways. Oh, well, yes, yes. Mm. Mm. Can no. we um, just briefly ask, I, I don't think there's much more time on the table. I didn't think so. But I, I, I thought of this question <laughs> yes. I'd like to ask you. You talked of this character here and the fields and, and the way Welsh names are sometimes given. Yes. Um, mm. uh, names like he's uh, uh, the name named the by the farm, yeah. which is very common uh, where my wife comes from. Yes, instance. of course, yes. Now, you are a Jones. Yes. Supposing... <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, Jones of the what would you be? <laughs> well, Jones the maggot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't do that. Uh, actually, actually, I'm I'm a bard, you know. Yes, of course. Uh, yes. Jones uh, Bard. The, 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 well, uh, you mean you have a bardic bard name? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, you couldn't guess what it is. That isn't uh, no, Jones Bard. No, uh, mm. no. <laughs> actually, it's. You'd be surprised. 
It's Glynn. <laughs> Very imaginative. Isn't it? Mm. I, I, I remember um, a story that Gwyn Jones told about getting off um, a train on the platform. Would it be at uh, oh, oh, Rubina? Yes. Uh, Rubina. Yeah, and uh, Orlando, there was a train full run. of Joneses because yes. Gwyn got off and Jack got off and Glynn got off. Yes, those two were together. Yes. And I was separate. And you met, was that we the first met time on, you'd met? Yeah, yes, yes. We met on the platform, just pouring with rain. Yes. And Gwyn Jones said, I'm Gwyn Jones. And Jack said, I'm Jack Jones. And I said, I'm Glynn Jones. And, and <laughs> we walked home together. The first. They knew one another before, but I didn't. Yes. Mm. Yeah. How did the friendship develop after that? Oh, then? Well, we be, I've been friends with Gwyn ever since, you know, and yes. I was friendly with Jack until he died. Mm. He came to our house every Sunday for about 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. I remember, mm. Glyn, oh, well, well, a few, a few years ago, you did a TV program with, with Jack Jones, didn't you? Or well, uh, yeah, Jack well, Jones, yes. It? It's rather uh, stretching it to say that I did a program with him. Right. Jack did the program, yes. and three or four of us were That's brought in to prompt Jack in oh. case he he faltered. You see, <laughs> well, actually, the problem was to shut him up, <laughs> not, <laughs> not to get him to go on. We just sat there mute. Yes. yes, I've been criticised, and I think quite fairly, that I, I'm never quite as, um, I never really go into the man's character half as much. Mm -hmm. I have to say that it is uh, women that I feel that I know something about, and it, it is the, the, all my books are basically yes. about a woman. Uh, yes. Two of them, I think, I've drawn fairly good pictures of, of men, but um, it's not what I do well. I do admit this. Yes, but you feel more comfortable writing from a woman's point of view. I, d I've, I do very much so. Uh, but strangely, um, I don't want to make out that I get a lot of fan letters, because I don't, but I've had more fan letters from men than I have from women. Perhaps you actually give them an insight into how I women don't know, think. But I'm, I've always been extremely pleased about that. Yes, yes. And my, my very first um, novel had lots of, of uh, letters of appreciation from men. That was one afternoon. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps now we could look at A Small Country, which is, as you said, quite a different book, but again highlights a lot of those issues. Um, I saw yes, I thought that uh, this one, where I went back to the time immediately before the First World War. I think with this one, I did try to show what dreadful lives women had, yes. how circumscribed they were. That's right. Um, for me, it paralleled the, the suffragette movement in London with Catherine's personal struggle for independence. Indeed, yes. Um, and yes. I thought that that comparison was very good, and the link with the, the visitor, with Edward, who comes to visit. And also as a... Um, a crisis, really, the challenge between duty and desire. Um, Jossie is torn, but yes. his desire overtakes him. In Edward's case, his duty is up front. He goes home to his fiancée, although he still continues to write to Catherine. Yes, and I, 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 suppose, um, I suppose, in a way, that I think desire is more important. Yes. I've always set enormous store on physical desire. Yes, I, I think, think lust is much more important than than people give it credit for. Yes, that comes That's the only thing that is absolute that we can depend on absolutely. <laughs> I think people that get married for the sake of money or security or they deserve all they get. Yes. And they they get it. That's I am thrilled to walk home with my hymn book under my arm, alongside my father, almost as tall as him now, my voice deepening, talking with him man to man, discussing the meaning of a difficult passage in the fifth chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews. When I arrive home and take a look around the stock in the sheds to save my father the trouble, I say to myself, I am Yorweth Hughes, my squin. A comfortable farm of 90 acres, still in good heart in spite of the evil days which are beginning to fall on farmers. 
I am Yorweth Hughes, Form 5A, who catches the bus at the crossroads with books under his arm. I am the traveller between two worlds, learning by experience the slow lesson of tolerance which every foreigner must learn. At school, I am the Israelite in Babylon, resistant to foreign influences and careful of my household gods, conforming outwardly in every detail to the pattern of a Llan Horse County schoolboy, but inwardly firm in my own upbringing and persuasion and faithful to another, higher dispensation. I am embarked now on my career, thoroughly and conscientiously determined to succeed. Thank you for that reading, Emma. It seems appropriate and yet ironic that a toy epic should be the focus of so much critical attention since its reprint a couple of years ago. Because despite being your first written novel back in the early 40s. It wasn't the first published, was it? it in, indeed, I think it was about the seventh novel to appear in uh, 1958. Could you tell us something of the circumstances under which it was written and, and how it came to be published 15 years after its inception? I'll try and cut a long story short because I'd, it started out as, as a, a, a novel in verse or what I thought would be a, a poem and um, I told uh, Graham Greene about this, and he said, that sounds very interesting. I would, uh, when you've done it, send it to me and I'll publish it. But when I came to do it, or try and do it in the first effort, I found uh, it really wasn't verse, it was prose, and it, it, had, it, it took on the kind of initial form that it, that it had. Um, and then it was too short. It was only about 25,000 words. Uh, Graham Greene went away to West Africa. The uh, subsequent sort of history of the thing was that I put it aside and went on to write The Little Kingdom for him when he came back. Yes. Uh, and that was my first published novel. And then many years later, when I worked in the BBC, the head of programmes then, a friend called Howell Davis, who alas is now dead, um, insisted that I f found uh, six half hours of Welsh uh, drama and um, wrote it myself because there was nothing in the kitty at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I fished out this original piece and extended it. Um, and having done that, um, then it was published by an Erin Talman Davis who had a a uh, publishing house called Club Radrew, oh. in, and, and then I, I thought, well, I may as well do it in English as well. Yes. And I put it all into English in, when I was working in London, starting to work in television. Uh, in the evenings, I, I did it in the summer of 58, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure, actually. The dates might be wrong. And then it was uh, published, and then it had the Hawthorndon Prize, so oh, yes. it had a strange career. Yes. I'm going to read a, a new short story of mine. It's called Sabbatical. When it was over and Professor Morian had climbed down from the top bunk, Mrs. Purchase said, Be careful to use the sparkle, not the pledge on the kitchen table. It's vinyl. She lay sprawled on the top bunk of the twins' double-decker in what was now the spare room since the twins were away at college. She was quite naked except for a pair of electric pink socks which she insisted on keeping on since the very hard skin on the soles of her feet was still being treated with a foot powder that might leave a clue on the carpet, she pointed out. And Professor Morian was always grateful that she thought of things like that. I was thinking that uh, even in the new story that you that you've read for us, uh, there's an affection for the characters, but but a, a wary distancing. I mean, you're not making fun of them, are you? No. Um, you once said to me, 
or wrote in an article that I had the baleful eye of an outsider, like Alan Lewis and Geraint Goodwin, and I was quite annoyed at the time. Yeah, you'll never forgive me, will you? But it's true, I think, that uh, a writer must distance himself be in order, it's not just to be objective, but to see a character in a round, a situation in a round, uh, so that even though you might be emotionally involved, you're still capable of taking a step backwards and saying, now what's all this? And the qualities of your short stories, I want to talk about the content uh, as the conversation proceeds, but the one thing that you've always insisted upon is that b is the beginning of the story. Yes. Now why is that so important in a short story? You must attract, gain and hold the reader's attention. And one must make an effort because you are seeking the reader's uh, time, you want his emotional uh, involvement, if you can get it, but in the end, like in every good s story, there's a sense of a window being revealed. The whole point of being a writer of any kind is to have something to say to show something. Look, it's like this, or this is what really happened, or that's what really decided her. And I've said it's not it's not what Katie did in the parlour, it's why she went there. Mm. And in order to take people on a journey, for no matter how short a journey, uh, you've got to get them on the train. And therefore the opening paragraphs are, are not just important for the, the reader, they're important for the writer. If I can't get the beginning right, I give it up. I think it's Saturday the 11th of May, 1991. My name is Michael Parnell and I'm sitting in the recording studio at the Polytechnic of Wales. Beside me is my great pleasure to have Bernice Rubens, who's going to talk with us and uh, read to us for a little while. Bernice Rubens is currently celebrating the publication of her 16th novel. It's meeting, as one would expect, uh, with a rapturous reception I think it would be fair to say that Bernice must now be widely regarded as one of the foremost novelists writing in English. And now I'm going to ask the author of all these books to read a little bit from her latest, Bernice Rubens. It's nice to be here, Michael. I'm going to read the first chapter of the new book, A Solitary Grief. Um, when you read a first chapter, there doesn't have to be a preamble. But, of course, that's a fallacy because there's no such thing as the beginning. When I say this is the beginning of a book, this book began possibly many years ago. Um, and I remember its provenance. I was driving down past Ely Cemetery, which isn't far from here, I don't think, and I saw a man coming out of the cemetery carrying a bunch of flowers. And I thought, that's very odd, it's the wrong way around. What kind of man could go into a cemetery and come out with the flowers? And it's the kind of idea that you put on the shelf of your mind and then in the fullness of time, when you're ready to accommodate it, it falls off the shelf. And I think a year ago that idea fell off the shelf and it's the beginning of this chapter. So I'll read the first chapter. Alistair Crown carried flowers out of the cemetery. He was that sort of person. He'd walked past it on his way to the hospital. Why not, he thought. A small detour amongst the graves would serve his purpose. After all, it wasn't every day his wife gave birth to their first child. Flowers were in order. He always did the right thing, did Alistair, but never without being aware of it. His right thing was premeditated, performed, and afterwards smugly relished. He carried the flowers furtively, as if embarrassed by them. Not for their provenance, their source would in no way disturb him, but for their untidiness and lack of symmetry. For Alistair was a punctilious man and needed order in all things. The lack of any kind of wrapping disturbed him, and he resolved, should he have need for flowers at any other time, that he would bring along his own paper. Keith Thomas, 
my best friend, decided that he was a 14 and a half year old Welsh Christian atheist and that I was a 14 and a half year old Welsh Jewish atheist. We had founded the Ethical Atheist Party. So far, only Keith and I were party members. We hadn't agreed yet who would be president, who vice president. We staged a secret vote, but it had been a draw. Keith had become an atheist because of his father, Mr. Thomas, when drunk, which was often, would become maniacally religious. He would shout out, Oh, Jesus Christ, happy is the man that trusteth in thee, and the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Keith often grumbled, It makes me sick. He got so much worse over the last few years, ever since my mother died. Keith rarely mentioned his mother, though sometimes he sighed, Wish I had older brothers like you have. I could do with a bit of help with my dad. Truth to tell, I wasn't so totally convinced about the non-existence of God as Keith was, but I loathed going to synagogue, disliked for the most part Jewish ritualistic custom and all its restrictions. It was so much more convenient to be an ethical atheist, more interesting to walk through the holy outdoor pageant of springtime on a breezy, air-delighted Saturday morning than to worship in an oppressive, stuffy, enclosed building. I mean, it's a critic's job, job to come along and, and see, you know, the deep, you know, the thematic and structural uh, 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 purpose of a, a character like uh, Uncle Isidore. In a sense, in Ash and the Young Man's Sleeve, and perhaps not quite as much in, in, in the new book, you feel that, that this is, in fact, um, um, one of the few uh, um, contacts that you as a young boy had with this other sort of Jewishness, a, a kind of a foreign Jewishness, a Jewishness yes. that was very much under, <coughs> under pressure in the 30s, obviously. Yes. And, and yes. Well, it's true, yes. It's, it's, uh, that, that is a signal from the past. Yes. Way, yes. It, the very alien nature. Yes. He, he looked different, he smelled different. Yes. You, you, you started to go into a more, a more yes. European accent with him. And, uh, oh, yes. Because, uh, but, but then I, I, when I've, uh, I've also written a, a, a one-act play called The Eccentric, uh, with using those sort of um, that accent, and it's got a certain kinds of, of, of rhythms. And I, I, you know, the the eccentric was a one act play has been done a great deal in schools, by the way, and um, I've seen it done and many times in in the professional theatre as well. And what interests me is that, uh, for example, in one production at the Arts Theatre in London, they had a, somebody of a, who was a, whose father was a German Jew, he was an actor whose father was a German Jew. And it, it didn't work. Uh, where I heard it, uh, other who had Eastern European accents, uh, uh, then uh, they could. Ke- uh, it was quite different. They had that sing-song voice, and it worked with the with the dialogue that I had written, and and uh, you know, <laughs> that 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 almost staged Jewish accent is uh, is one that I I can reproduce just as I hope I can other kind of intonations. Mm. When did you start to write? Was it in the Burnley days or when you returned to oh, Wales? Oh, no, it's much too busy. Yes, I and bet. <laughs> <laughs> With, the, you know, With two children well fast, and a husband. Yes. I started when we were living out on a, a farm. We were trying to get... Maureen got a job back in Glamorgan, and we were trying to get a house near the job. Yeah. And, and the teachers were on their lowest possible ebb of money. It was just sort of to a couple of hundred pounds a year, yes, it was terrible. Yes, yeah. um, so f- temporarily we lived in a house on top of the mountain, three miles from the nearest bus, and that only went twice a week. Mm. And uh, we lived there because rent-free, because nobody was living there, mm. but the farmer wanted it kept warm for when his son was old enough to live there. Right. So there I started writing because there was nothing else, else to, to do. do. <laughs> this is when you, you'd move back to South Wales with your husband's yes. job. Yeah. And so you, this is, it's lovely to sort of explore the origins of a writer like you. You're yeah. sitting down because there's nothing else to do. And what yeah. was the first thing you e- actually ever wrote that you had the confidence to send out into the world? Well, I used to enter these new statesman competitions. You know, yeah. you write 250 words of pastiche or something and you get a guinea. Yes. Um, the, the breakthrough was I won a, an essay prize in the Sunday Observer. Mm. 
and uh, then I got letters from agents saying, what else have you written? Ah. And I said, nothing. And they got me onto um, women's magazine stories for a while. And then I wrote a play. And the agent, it was supposed to be West End play. Yes, I'd like and to hear about days, that. Yeah. They, were all, um, they were all drawing room comedies. I mean, I was told this. You've got yes. to write middle class drawing room comedies. That's the only thing they do, just before John Osborne. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wrote one about a hypnotist. And uh, he tried it all around the West End stage and nobody would take it. A so hypnotist. as a last resort, he went slumming and uh, sent it to the television centre. The story is called A Flight of Geese. My uncle Winford wasn't really my uncle. He was my great uncle, my grandmother's brother. I used to visit him often on my way home from school. He lived in a small house at the edge of the village with his wife and two daughters. He also had two sons, but they lived in London. And one of them was a famous footballer, an international. A colour photograph of him wearing his international cap and shirt, his arms folded across his chest, stood on the sideboard. My uncle had given up regular work when he was a young man. He had come home unexpectedly early from the engine room at the steelworks and announced his philosophy of leisure. Anne, he had said to his wife, I shall not be going to work again. There's too much talk about the dignity of labour. One life is all we have, and I'm not spending mine in senseless toil. And he never did. So there are American poems coming down, but, but not stories as yet, then? Presumably um, that's a long There are some stories. Um, there are some stories which use America uh, and other places. For example, I think, um, I think that... Uh, let me find... In my... In Sing It Again, Wordsworth, which I like very much, there are American incidents in that story. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's the strangest story in this collection. It, it's a kind of a circular story, like those hop stock, scotch things that the girls used to draw on the pavements when I was a child. So you circle round the thing and then dive on its meaning. Yeah. And that is, I think I'm really quite a, an experimental short story writer. Really, and that was a definite experiment. Um, do, do you do you surprise yourself then? I mean, in a story like that, or in Flight oh, yes. of Geese, do you know where you're going when you no, start? No, 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 I don't. Um, and that's very, very difficult. I, I, my method of writing stories is not unlike my method of writing poems, but it's deliberate. I do, never write a deliberate poem. Mm. I wait for it to come until I can no longer hold it at bay, mm. and then I write it. Mm. But. Um, the stories I do write deliberately. I begin with my little paragraph and I write it very slowly by hand and I work all day long from nine o'clock to five o'clock and I stop then. I take my sheets of paper and I read them until I go to bed and I put little notes down at the side, uh, make what kind of coat is he wearing and so on and so on. And I know everything about my characters, things I'm never going to use at all. I know where their aunts live in Birmingham. I know what size shoes they take. I know everything. And um, I mean, I haven't made that up. I, uh, they come into my story. I, I say, here's a little story. Here's a little world to my reader. Come in and see what's happening. And these guys walk into my stories and they talk. And I am surprised as anything by this. I mean, I'd never thought they were going to say that. Yeah. So I write it down. The story, when I finish it, I take maybe five or six weeks, is five or six times as long as the eventual story. Now I cut out everything that isn't truly relevant, tied up, that I can justify by some other place in the story. I take it all out, which means oftentimes doing away with passages of work that have delighted me and surprised me, but out they go. You're very ruthless. Oh, absolutely, that. absolutely. I, I uh, want my creative writing students to watch this tape when we finished yeah. it because that that is one of the hardest things to do, really. Yes, it and, is. and not because it's it, the writing hasn't worked no. in, 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 in 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 small in, on its own terms, yes, but, but um, it doesn't does nothing to do with the story. Similarly, in the poem, I get I get a present to to start the poem off. It's 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 what the French call the donné, the gift, and and that is maybe just a little phrase 
or maybe a little tune of about six notes or something. But that is the nub of the poem. That's where this poem starts off. And then I write it down, and from there on, it kind of feeds on itself. And uh, bit by bit, the images cling together, and one thing suggests another thing, and then I get sent other things that I've never thought of at all, so I put them down on a sheet of paper at the side, knowing that I'll bring them in later on. And then, and then I finish the, the poem. I don't know what the poem is about until I finish it. I have no idea what it's about until that's what it's about. And I put the last line down, and now I've got to finish the poem with this big gap in and all these bits and pieces at mm. the side that I have to... And then having done all that and having polished the poem and having cut it down to size, I always take off normally the first stanza I've written, because this is where I was doing my weightlifting exercises. And then I certainly cross out that little gift, that little phrase which gave me the poem. However beautiful and however remarkable, and some of them have just astonished me, they truly are nothing to do with the poem. That's like the self-starter on your car. Out it goes. Mm -hmm. The question I was going to ask you, the final one, is is um, we're talking there about uh, a landscape in Rhonda which uh, is, is shifting and changing anyway, but I mean, at least it, there, there's some kind of route there. But, and I want to come back to this, because I think you evade it. Yeah. Um, there's also all these, what can I call them, these external forces that keep coming into the lives of people in South Wales and of yourself. And I do mean, I suppose, cinema and uh, wars yeah, and, and uh, yeah. national politics and, uh, and all the rest of it. <coughs> and that's all there in your books as well. Yeah, well, you know, we were influenced, weren't we? You, you couldn't dodge that either, you know. Uh, cinemas were a religion, you know. Mm. You went to see a film and you spoke about it the following day and pretended to be different kind of characters. Mm. Edward G. Robinson, you know. Cagney, uh, cowboys. Yeah, they were. Uh, they, but they weren't so much exterior. They belonged, didn't they? You That's know? what I'm saying. They you belonged. You right. Know, you, they belonged. You, you were very South Walian characters. Actually, sometimes speak as if they're coming out of the streets of. Uh, I was going to say Chicago, but I suppose I mean Hollywood. Yeah. Well, the world began to shrink with the cinemas, I suppose. And now it's like a peanut. You know. Is it a bad thing? It's inevitable. I don't want to moralise. But you, oh, come on, you just be moralising about tourists and the Rhonda? Yeah, well, tourism is a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> you moralise when you want to, and you, and you, and you don't <laughs> when you don't want to. Well, I'm entitled, I. <laughs> <laughs> but what about immoralising? Immoral, yeah. I think you can afford to be immoral if you want to. Or amoral, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Take the consequences, that's all. So, so that's I'll be cunning. Be very cunning. So if you take your lumps in it, it's all right? Yeah. By and large. Take the bumps. Mm. Ah. Yeah, sure. And then it's so long, Hector Bebb. That's right. Yeah. I manufactured Hector Bebb almost entirely from half a dozen boxes. Um, and I certainly manufactured the the landed gentry who were in the book, book you know. Uh, took me a long time to do it. I couldn't find the form. Mm. I, did, I wrote it as straight narrative which, uh, without any exterior characters, you know. And ultimately I found it. It took me a long time. Well, whatever else, Ronald, we come to the end of a conversation, uh, not because the tapes run out, but because uh, you've got that achievement there already. I mean, you say you don't worry about the books being in print. But I can assure you that uh, a hell of a lot of people out there are determined that they should be in print again and be well, there hope, for I reading. Hope, I hope so, but I never think about it, tell you the truth. It seems to me that it's... Uh, there's nothing I can do, you see. Yeah. What the hell can I... I can't do anything. You've done it. Why should I, why should I bother, you know? They've gone off like pigeons.